I want to share with you the craziest DMEC surgery that I've ever been a part of. About a month ago, I was performing DMEC in an eye with bullous keratopathy secondary to glaucoma. And during this operation, after the decimetorexis had been done, the patient experienced on the operating room table a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. And I observed this because the eye became rock hard and the chamber collapsed and the patient's IOL in the capsular bag came prolapsing up anteriorly through her two millimeter pupil. When I recognized the problem, I put a stitch in the main wound and concluded the case, but then the patient comes back to clinic the next day. She has the whole IOL and the capsular bag jammed up against the back surface of the cornea, and she has this massive suprachoroidal hemorrhage. We send her to the retina specialist, and he says that we can drain the suprachoroidal hemorrhage two weeks later. And when that's done, then maybe we can do something about this IOL in the anterior chamber and about the decompensated cornea. So what I suggested is at the time of draining the suprachoroidal hemorrhage, why not try to refixate her existing lens in the eye and perform the originally scheduled DMEC. And that's what this video is that I wanna show. It's a combined procedure to drain the suprachoroidal hemorrhage, to refixate her IOL, and to do a DMEC. Here's the retina surgeon. He's taken down the conjunctiva temporarily in the location of the suprachoroidal hemorrhage. He's hooking the muscle. I'm gonna make a paracentesis and instill an anterior chamber maintainer to pressurize the eye such that then when he cuts down into the sclera here with a hockey stick knife and depresses the edge of this wound, now that blood will come gushing out. Here's what the eye looks like. The cornea is sallow and green and the IOL and the capsular bag are all mushed up against the back surface of the cornea and the chamber is collapsed. So I'm gonna make a few little paracentesis here and then a three millimeter clear corneal wound. And my original plan here is to take this IOL out, which is encased in this capsular bag with summering material, by cutting it in pieces and then removing these pieces from the eye. However, when I try to do this, when I try to reach into the eye and grab the lens with IOL grasping forceps and to cut it with these IOL cutting scissors, what I observe is the chamber is shallow and I can't really finagle my instruments in. So I abandon this plan and I think, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to expand this wound to approximately five millimeters in the clear cornea using this keratome. And then I'm just gonna remove the IOL in the capsular bag on mass. And that is to avoid inadvertently dropping anything into the back of the eye because the cornea here is extremely swollen and hazy and it's gonna be very difficult to retrieve anything that falls into the posterior segment. So I think, okay, well, I'm just gonna remove that lens in the capsular bag. I'm cleaning up a little bit of this fibrous membrane. But now we have to scleral fixate this lens into the eye. And my preferred technique for that these days is a glued IOL. Uh, this is the Amar Agrawal technique. So I'll make some pyridomies nasally and temporally. And then directly 180 degrees across from each other, I will make these scleral flaps. I'm dissecting them partial thickness here with a crescent knife. And um, this is used first to groove the flaps and then to tunnel through the sclera carefully just to make these flaps 180 degrees apart. And at the base of these flaps, one millimeter from the limbus, I'll make a 23 gauge sclerostomy with a 23 gauge needle. And that is to externalize the haptics of the IOL. Now in this case, 
I'm going to use the patient's own IOL. I removed it in a single piece. So I removed it from the eye. I strip all of these membranes, these capsular adhesions off, and then I push it back into the eye and I'll externalize the haptics via the sclerostomy. This is the second flap I'm making 180 degrees away from the first flap in the same fashion, just using this crescent knife. And visualization is important. So I'm dabbing this blood away uh, while I make this flap. So here I am just sort of making this little tunneling flap. I have the eye filled with air during this stage, by the way, because it's important to have a pressurized globe, a firm eye, so you can control the depth of your dissection here with the crescent knife. So here are two nice flaps 180 degrees apart. I'm instilling now into the pars plana, this is a chandelier illuminator. And the chandelier illuminator is going to be of invaluable assistance later on because you have so much better visibility through a hazy cornea. These are the sclerostomies, the 23 gauge needle. I test and verify their patency with those coaxial forceps. Here is the patient's old IOL. It's the same thing we removed from the eye. I've cleaned it off. I'm reaching through these sclerostomies. This is with a 25 gauge coaxial max gripping forceps. I grab the haptic of the IOL and I just pull it out through that sclerostomy. And this is quite easy to do even with this poor visualization because just using those coaxial forceps to grip the end of the haptic is so much simpler than trying to dock something with a Yamani needle. There's the IOL in the eye, and now it's time to inject the DMAT graft. And you'll notice that I'm using retroillumination with the with the um, chandelier illuminator. And even though the cornea is hazy and opaque with retroillumination, you have a wonderful visualization of the fine details of the graft. It's injected in this eye, previously a fake it, now with a large centered scleral fixated IOL. The graft is sitting on the IOL and I'm checking the Motsuro side here with this cannula to see whether it's right side up or not. And I'm tapping along trying to get an edge. And as I engage this lateral fold here with the cannula, the curve is up. It's embracing the cannula and that means the graft is right side up. So now that the graft was fortuitously injected right side up, I can unfold the graft on top of the IOL without risking losing it, dropping it into the back of the eye. A no-touch technique is often talked about enthusiastically with DMET graft unfolding as being the preferred method, but really in these complicated eyes, whatever you have to do to unfold this graft, I recommend doing it. Here's the graft mostly unfolded in the proper right side up orientation sitting atop the scleral fixated lens. And what I'm going to do to complete the centration is I'm going to reach into the eye using these coaxial max gripping forceps and I'm going to grab the edge of the graft and I'm going to drag it over to center it in the eye before I lift it up to the posterior corneal surface on an air bubble. So I'm holding one edge and I'm tapping the opposing side using a cannula on the surface of the eye. And you'll notice I still have a little kink there in the graft, but that's okay. I just reach across the eye internally and I use my cannula to poke this graft over. And if you're cringing and thinking, oh, you're touching the graft, you really shouldn't be doing that. This is an unedited video showing the graft unfolding. Graft unfolding in this extremely difficult eye can proceed safely here in the span of, this is a minute, 90 seconds or so. It's quick and it's effective and that's what you need in such a complicated eye. You need something that works reliably. Here the graft is unfolded and I'm going to lift it up to the posterior corneal surface atop an air bubble. This is all done through the main wound, by the way. So if you're a fan of suturing the wound with DMEC, you may reconsider it because the main wound is so useful when doing these various unfolding maneuvers. You'll notice that I have a fold still there distally 
in the graft edge. And the way you reduce a fold in a DMAT graft after it's been lifted is you shrink the size of the air bubble, you aspirate some of that air, and that gives the bubble more or less room or real estate to move over. So you apply taps on the corneal surface, the so-called bubble bumping technique, and you can iron out these folds that are lingering in the corneal periphery for these DMAT graft edges. So I'm gonna show you here now, look how much worse the visibility into the anterior chamber is with this direct illumination versus with the chandelier illumination. The red reflex provides you with so much better visualization. I think the surgery would be literally impossible without the chandelier illuminator in such a complicated case. You can see when you flip back and forth, it is an enormous difference in the clarity of what is going on. So I'll use this little cannula here and I turn the lights on just so I can find my paracentesis. And now I've got the cannula on top of the graft and I'm just sort of poking that edge over, open into the periphery. And there it is. And now the graft is fully unfolded. This is a large diameter graft, by the way. This is a nine millimeter graft. That's my preferred graft diameter in these aphakic eyes in which you have a scleral fixated lens. You need something big so it occupies space and you can get nice compression in this otherwise hyper deep anterior chamber. The graft is totally unfolded and I'm lifting up, lifting it up completely to the posterior corneal surface on top of an air bubble. And this is the conclusion of the operation. This is the end of the case. And I show this video because uh, the surgery was very personally gratifying to perform. It was a fun, challenging case. And I think that this, I think, probably should be very good evidence that DMEC is possible in any eye. This is an eye that has a suprachoroidal hemorrhage that has an IOL mashed up against the back surface of the cornea that has no iris and no visibility. And in this case, we drain the suprachoroidal hemorrhage, we re-scleral fixate the patient's existing IOL and perform DMEC. So if DMEC can be done under these circumstances, there is probably literally no eye that is too sick for DMEC. I think the key concepts here that were important are number one, the sort of belief in the possibility of the procedure. You notice the DMAT graft unfolding here, the component of that operation, that was the part that I showed unedited because that was the part of the surgery that took two minutes. Every other component of this operation, this was the span of hours of work on this eye. But the scary part, the part that people are afraid of, the DMEC, that was 90 seconds, two minutes worth of manipulation, which was very straightforward. So belief in the possibility of this surgery was important. Number two, I think it's very, very important in these eyes with horrible corneal edema and terrible view into the anterior chamber to use chandelier illumination. Chandelier illumination is indispensable to take advantage of the red reflex when the cornea is hazy. That is a necessary thing to have if you're doing a case like this. And I would say the third thing that's important if you're doing DMEC in these eyes is it's very important that you are comfortable with some means for scleral fixating an IOL. I like the glued IOL rather than the Umani technique because I'm confident that I can do the glued IOL blind basically and I can use a lens of my choice choosing. It doesn't have to have these PVD blue haptics. You can use whatever lens, including a lens that's already in the eye. And with the glued IOL, you fixate the lens one millimeter posterior to the limbus rather than two and a half millimeters back. And with the IOL diaphragm, that support so much higher up in the eye, the chamber is shallower. You're not unfolding a DMAT graft in some hyper deep anterior chamber. You have a more or less normal depth anterior chamber. 
So facility with a, with a scleral fixated IOL technique, especially the glued IOL, I think is so important for a hardcore DMEC surgeon. So I hope that this video amused you, if nothing else, and these pearls may make some of your own challenging DMEX more fun and more possible.